Hey friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead. I'm back with week two of the Every Bit Counts Challenge. This is the challenge I do every August where I try to preserve something every single day. So this week, I'm gonna show you what we got done. We pickled a lot of miscellaneous vegetables. I'll show you that. We did a lot of corn processing. We canned and froze corn in various ways. We canned corn relish. Of course, we freeze dried lots of different goodies. And then finally, I'm going to show you step two in the um, salt cured egg yolk process that we began last, last week. So for now, let's go ahead and hop into what we were able to do on Monday. So on Monday morning, I took a little stroll through the garden and just kind of filled my basket with anything that I could find. Lots of various goodies here. And we've got all sorts of stuff. We've got beans. We've got cherry tomatoes. We've got cucumbers, peppers, you name it. And so when I have miscellaneous vegetables like this, here you see just a bunch of different kinds of beans. We've got banana peppers, jalapeno peppers. Um, there's a little bit of okra. Our okra is just beginning to produce. And then of course the cucumbers. When I reach this point where it's not enough for a big batch, I'm gonna show you how I pickle vegetables all at the same time. I've got some jars here. We're just gonna fill pints and half pints with these miscellaneous vegetables. So here that's what it looks like. As you can see, we've got our pe peppers here. This is a mix of banana and jalapeno. We've got sliced cucumbers. There's some jalapenos. We've got all sorts of beans. And then the last jar is just some okra mixed with some beans. The next thing we're gonna do is spice these up a little bit. I just have some fresh dill from the garden. We've got peppercorns, crushed red pepper, mustard seed here, a little bit of our homegrown garlic, and then of course some salt. And spices and salt are not necessary for safe pickling. Pickling, it's all about the pH in the vinegar brine. These spices are just kind of however you want them to taste however you want your pickled veggies to taste and so today i just filled i put a little bit of garlic in each of the jars i also put about a fourth a teaspoon of salt and then the ones i wanted to make into pickles i just added a little bit of the dill and all of the other spices and seasonings but you really can't go wrong with this you could add a little bit of onion, you can add turmeric if you want to have a vibrant color in your jars. Whatever you want here, it isn't gonna affect the safety of your canning. Now what does affect the safety of the canning is the pH level of the vinegar in the brine. Remember, vegetables have to be pressure canned because they're a low acid food unless you're going to pickle them with a vinegar brine that will make it acidic enough to be safe for water bath canning. So when I make my brine, I use two parts vinegar to one part water to a half part sugar. And I just put that all on the stove until that sugar dissolves. And then I fill my jars with that brine. And that makes it so that these jars can be safely water bath canned. This is an excellent way to use up just those odds and ends vegetables that you have in your fridge. All of these veggies, the pickling recipe for them in the ball canning book is 10 minutes for pints. So all of them share the same time for processing. Therefore, you can put them all in the water bath canner at the same time, process them all for 10 minutes, and they're gonna be safe. And I will use these my kids love pickled vegetables as pizza toppings. They'll also sometimes, just as a snack, we'll pull out a jar of these dilly beans or pickled cherry tomatoes, and all through the winter, we can have these as a snack with our lunches, and it really works out great. So once again, after just 10 minutes in the water bath canner, we used up those little odds and ends of vegetables that I harvested from the garden that day that were otherwise, you know, maybe not going to get used up, and it worked out great. All right, moving on to Tuesday. On Later on Monday, I went to a local sweet corn farm, and I purchased six bushel bags of sweet corn. Now, sweet corn is something that I don't grow myself because of my limited garden space. I've just decided that the amount of space it takes to feed our family 
sweet corn that I would rather support a local farm and devote my garden space to something else. And so six bushel bags gave us approximately 300, somewhere between 300 to 350 ears of corn. And the children were put hard at work um, helping me shuck all of this corn. I would say shucking corn is definitely the hardest part about processing this amount of corn. And so this is when having a lot of children <laughs> as helpers really comes in handy. Um, all those little hands. And on this day, we decided to go to my parents' house to process our corn. And we did this for several reasons. My parents' house is large and the kids could run around and play. My mom's kitchen is a little larger. It has air conditioning. And as you'll see when we get into the kitchen, it's set up for canning to where I can do multiple batches at the same time. So sometimes when I'm processing large amounts of produce like that, I go over to my mom's and um, we hang out and I just do my processing in her kitchen. The little boys, the two youngest, are at an age where they get out of the corn shucking because they aren't quite fast enough and I think the big kids would rather do it without them. So they're happily playing their toys and while the kids finish shucking, I am getting busy kind of rinsing off the corn. Um, you don't need to scrub it really thoroughly, but I scrub just to get the corn silks off. They won't hurt if you have corn silks in your canned corn, but I just like to try to get as much of that off as possible. So that is what I'm doing here. So as I mentioned, on this day, we're going to be processing all of this corn in several different ways. We're going to can some of it off the cob. We're also going to blanch and freeze some either on the cob or also off the cob. So lots of different ways that we're going to preserve the corn today. And I am just going to show you exactly how we're going to do that. So the first step, the first batch that I'm doing is for canning. And the kids are still bringing in the corn in batches as they're shucking it. I'm putting it by the sink to be rinsed. Uh, my mom is going to help me with rinsing that. And I am getting to work taking this corn off the cob. Now, when you're taking corn off the cob for canning, it's important that you don't cut too far into the cob. I use a special tool here. I'm going to link it in the description. It's extremely handy for decobbing your corn. Um, if you don't have this tool, you can just use a knife and cut it off. And then we are not wasting those cobs. I'm putting them in these uh, garbage cans behind me, but all of those bags were pulled out and brought home to feed to the animals. Last year, I showed you how you can also make corn cob jelly out of the cobs by simply making a juice and processing jelly. And I will link the video in the description that shows you how to do that. We did not do that this year though, because we still have some jelly left over from last year. Now, once our corn was taken off the cob, I am just putting it directly into my canning jars here. It's raw at this point. This corn is going to cook through the canning process, so I don't need to do anything to it to prepare it for canning. On this first batch, I'm canning in pints. I like to do some of my canned corn in pints for when it's just gonna be an addition to maybe a chicken pot pie or something like that. If I'm canning corn as a side dish for my large family, I'm definitely going to choose to put it in quarts instead. So just doing one little batch here in pints, obviously filling with water. And when you're canning your corn like this, you can raw pack these. This water is just room temperature. Remember, if you fill your jars with room temperature water, that means that your um, jars also need to be room temperature. And then the temperature of the water that you put into the canner will also need to be room temperature. All of the temperatures of the various liquids need to match in order to prevent any glass breaking. Also, in order to prevent glass breaking, it is best practice not to use a metal knife in order to take your bubbles out of your jars. But this is all I could find in my mom's kitchen. So I'm being very careful not to bang the edges or the bottom of the jar with that metal or I could crack my jars. So just be very careful. Make sure you have the appropriate headspace here. After you remove the bubbles, you might need to fix your water line and then wipe the rims of your jars. Canned sweet corn is probably one of my favorite vegetables to can because I think the flavor of it, the taste of it is really good. Some veggies 
after canning, um, it can affect the taste, like carrots or even green beans, the taste can be slightly different after canning. But sweet corn is just really good, and it's so convenient to have this canned corn when you want to make a quick meal in the winter. It's already pre-cooked, so literally all you have to do is warm it up and serve it, and it's a nice little side dish. So I always make sure to can enough sweet corn to get us through the whole winter, through the rest of the year, because it really is a family favorite here. So just getting my lids on my jars. Remember, I have a code to get 10% off your canning lids, and you can see that in the description. Now, this is my mom's amazing stove. <laughs> it's so dreamy. If only I had something like this in my house with the canning that I do. If you're ever um, redoing your kitchen, renovating it, and you're a canner, get yourself one of these pot fillers like my mom has that's just right over the stove. It fills your canning pots, and it's super convenient. Now you guys can see why I come here to do my canning. So the pints are going to process for 55 minutes. This is me figuring out how to use a gas stove <laughs> that I'm not used to. I have electric at home. So the pints are going to process for 55 minutes. The quarts are for 85 minutes. And now I've got my corn that was taken off the cob in this pot of boiling water. We're going to blanch it. So to blanch that corn, it's just in the boiling water for approximately two minutes. And then as soon as that two minutes are up, I shock it with cold water. You can also put it in an ice bath if you want, but I find just running ice cold water over it does the same trick. Now you blanch vegetables to stop the enzyme action. It helps retain some of the nutrients during the freezing process. It also really helps with the texture uh, when you thaw the frozen vegetables. Now once we Run it under the cold water. We're gonna get some of the excess water out of it by just sticking it on a towel here. And then we are gonna be using our food saver. I'll link in the description the food saver that I have. This is my mom's here and it works out great. This is a vacuum sealer that helps you get the excess air out of your packages. It really helps prevent freezer burn and it preserves your vegetables much uh, better. So here I'm gonna show you, I'm taking, this is some of the corn that we blanched on the cob. We're doing it in little packages for my parents here. And you just take the package, you put it in the food saver here, it pulls out all the oxygen. And once the oxygen is done, that red light comes on and it seals the package for you. And when you're all done, you have a little vacuum sealed package that can go in to the freezer. It's extremely convenient. So that first batch of corn that I put in is done here, and I'm just pulling that out. I've got another batch of quarts in the canner, and this is just basically what we did for about five hours on this day, just running around preserving corn in all of the various ways. And I was able to do three batches of corn, which gives me 21 quarts of corn, and then also one batch of pint jars. And then we froze all of this on the cob. We did little portions because my mom only had the little bags available for vacuum sealing, but this will be great. And then we also, you can see, have a lot of it that was taken off the cob that I'm going to take home and freeze dry. So when we left, just a couple of the batches were done. I left the other batches on the stove for my mom to take out of the canner later on. And then I was gonna go pick all the jars up once they'd sealed. On the way out by my parents' driveway, I noticed that they have mature, ripe elderberries already, and since they weren't going to use them, I decided to forage for them. So foraging is a great way to preserve, put up some extra food. If you don't have a huge garden, just take a walk through the woods and see what you can find to put away for your family and fill your um, pantry. I will show you in a couple days here what we're gonna do with these elderberries. So I just foraged what I could find without risking the poison ivy that was back in the woods. Then when we got home, the children had saved all of the husks from the corn. Those will not be wasted. They portioned them out into the burlap sacks that the corn came in. And the heifers here are going to enjoy this lovely snack here over the rest of the week. We are just dumping a little bit out of a time at a time. Cows really love the corn silks 
and the corn husks. So nothing goes to waste. The cobs, the leftover cobs went to our chickens because they like to pick all of the excess corn off of those and then they compost whatever's left over. So once we got home, I got all of that corn in the freezer here. We're really starting to fill up this little freezer that I'm working on um, getting full before the end of August. And then I started a batch of that corn that I took off the cob. I'm getting it in the freeze dryer. And then I will show you after this um, finishes processing what this freeze dried corn looks like. It's going to be super convenient to have that freeze dried corn just to toss into quick soups. It's also a great tasty snack just eaten raw. So that was it for Tuesday. Now we're going to move on to Wednesday. Another day I just went out and picked some stuff in the garden. We're having to pick our tomatoes a little green and let them ripen off the vine because the critters are, as soon as they start to blush, I'm having critters nibbling on all my tomatoes. So these will ripen indoors. I also was able to just get some peppers, a little acorn squash. We got some celery and cabbage. And today you can see in my very beat up ball blue book, this is the canning book that I really obviously love a lot. I've used it for the last 15 years <laughs> all the time. There's a corn relish recipe in here that I really like, and I will link that in the description for you. It's available on the internet. So here are all my ingredients. We've got the celery and cabbage from my garden, some green peppers and jalapeno peppers, that corn that I took off the cob yesterday, and then all of the various spices and vinegar that we're gonna need to make this relish. So all I did is I chopped it all up and added all of the amounts that are listed in that recipe that once again is in the description. And we've got that on the stove, bringing it to a boil. Once it finished and came to that boil, I'm filling up my pint jars. And this recipe makes approximately six pints. You may be wondering, what do I use corn relish for? Well, it is wonderful um, as a kind of like a salsa. You can scoop it out with corn chips and eat it that way. We like it on top of our tacos or burritos. I had a friend tell me she likes to put it on top of her mashed potatoes. It is extremely delicious. I highly suggest this recipe. We really like it. So I make this every year with some of the corn. And then once you get your jars filled, we came with six and a half pints. This is going to process in the water bath canner for, I believe it was 20 minutes. Let me check. Okay, I checked. It's actually 15 minutes. I have too many canning recipes running through my brain this time of year. It's hard to keep them straight. So these processed in the water bath for 15 minutes. And when we came home later that night, they were all sealed. I'm labeling them and getting these put up on the pantry shelves. So six and a half more pints to add to the pantry. It's very exciting. And then on Thursday morning, we woke up and that freeze-dried corn that I had put in the other day was done and this texture is just amazing you guys and freeze drying always intensifies the flavor the sweetness and things so you can literally eat these like a snack just like dried corn kernels we ended up with five quarts of that also headed to the pantry shelves and it's very exciting if you want more information on freeze drying check it out in the description of this video now, here are those elderberries that we foraged the other day. If you freeze elderberries and pull them out, the berries will simply fall off the stems. That will save you a whole lot of time and keep your fingers from turning bright purple from having to pull all of those berries off of the stems. So you just give them a little bit of, shake, of a shake, and as you can see, the berries fall right off. And then once you're done, you just kind of have to pick out all of the stems that kind of fall out behind. So nice little time saver there. We like to freeze or freeze dry our elderberries. And then as cold and flu season approaches, if we want a little immune boost, I will make elderberry syrup out of the elderberries. So here we go. We have that tray of the elderberries that are heading to the freeze dryer. I also had some leftover oatmeal from that morning. It was peaches and coconut cream oatmeal. I figured I would just freeze dry the extras as a nice snack. And then the final two um, trays of freeze dried corn here, using up the rest of that that we had taken off the cob. 
And this right here is the life of a homeschooling, homesteading mom during food preservation season. I've got my oldest son. I was proctoring his science test while I was getting these trays prepared for the freeze dryer. So always busy, always helping with school, always putting up food. This is what life looks like this time of year. Now, if you remember in last week's video, I showed you how I was salt curing egg yolks. You guys will remember that I put a dozen egg yolks here in the salt, and it's been sitting in the fridge for the last 10 days. And you can see that the uh, moisture has been pulled out of the yolks by the salt, and they are hard little pucks. But the process is not done. Let me show you right here the one of the yolks accidentally cracked and you can see that it's kind of gummy and I can't get the salt off of it, so that one will not be used. We ended up with 11 of the yolks that were just fine. So once again, just brushing off the extra salt and setting those aside, and then I'm gonna show you the next step in preserving them. A lot of you asked what I will use these for. These are a Parmesan cheese replacer. Once they're fully dried, they can be grated just like cheese can, and we will add that on top of our food for par Parmesan cheese flavor. So this salt that is left will be put in the oven on the very lowest setting, I believe it was on 170, and just put it in there and let the heat dry it out, and then we will reuse it for another batch of the salt cured egg yolks next week. Just gonna wash our container out to get everything as clean as possible. And now we're gonna move on to step two of this process. I have some clean uh, cheesecloth right here. If you don't have cheesecloth, any kind of breathable fabric would work. So you could use a clean cotton t-shirt if you wanted to. Anything like that that's just going to allow a little bit of air to flow through it, but also would keep you know bugs or anything out of your egg yolks. So just cutting a little strip of this cheesecloth here. Now we're gonna lay out the cheesecloth and I'm just lining up all of my egg yolks just like this in the middle of my strip of fabric. And then we are gonna end up wrapping the yolks up kind of like a little burrito here in our fabric. I've got some yarn here. You could use twine, any kind of tie that will hold this together. And I am just tying in between each of these egg yolks, kind of making like, they look like little candy in their wrappers. Now these egg yolks look dry, but they're not quite done. If you went to the very center of these, they might still be a little gummy, and any moisture is going to not be helpful in preserving these long term. So what we're going to do is we're actually gonna hang these egg yolks somewhere cool, ideally in, in somewhere 50 degrees or less, um, and we're gonna hang them for the next seven to 10 days for step two of the drying process. So this is definitely a little bit of a labor of love, but it will be worth it for the delicious grated egg yolk Parmesan cheese when we're all done. I ended up hanging mine out in my overflow fridge, just hung it from the top shelf, and it will be there for the next week. And next week, I will show you what these look like when they're all done. Finally, we're moving on to Friday. This was a very busy day in our house. We did a lot of cleaning, so I needed a really quick preservation project. I have done a whole video on how I can cranberry juice before. It's not the typical time of year to be canning cranberries because there's a lot of fresh produce available but I need the freezer space for the heifers that we're getting ready to process. So I'm trying to clear out freezers and figured this would be a quick project that I could do today that would fulfill my obligation to preserve something every single day. So for more details on this, check out the link to the video in the description. I'm just gonna give you a quick overview. So all you do is you just fill your jars here in the bottom with your whole cranberries. And you can fill them with as much or as little as you want. Obviously, the more you put in there, the more concentrated your juice is going to be. Then you're just going to fill the rest of the way with water. And then you're going to process in the water bath canner for 20 minutes. It's really that simple. This is the same process that you would use for blueberry juice or grape juice. When you're all done, you have seven quarts here of delicious, beautiful, homemade cranberry juice. And it's really that easy. And on that same day, my trays in the freeze dryer were completed. 
And so I'm just getting those elderberries off the trays. They kind of stuck a little bit. But we got a pint and a half of freeze-dried elderberries to make syrup this winter. And then we also had, I believe, two more quarts of um, freeze-dried corn. And every little bit counts. That's the whole point of this challenge, guys. You don't need to do a lot every day in order to make a big impact and, and have a nice full pantry. These little bits here and there, just doing something, anything that you can accomplish every day to add to your food storage just fills your pantry up just that more. So hopefully you guys enjoyed seeing all of the projects that we did this week. I didn't include the days where I did repeat projects. Um, next week I have some exciting stuff. We're hoping to start working on tomatoes and peaches. So there'll be lots of canning, fun stuff coming up. In the meantime, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Check out the hashtag EveryBitCountsChallenge and see what everybody else is doing. Until next week, friends. Bye. We'll talk to you later.